Okay, it's connecting. <gasps> There's Mr. Nichols. You, you came in, didn't you? All right, go ahead and make sure you sign in. Okay, all right. Let's go back to where we were. Okay, how about now? It's, now, it's recording everybody can now. see my application. All right, you got your little, it, it gave you a little box saying that I was recording? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. I love you guys. Thank you. All righty. So let's go to the why, what causes high-risk pregnancy? One, is it the pregnancy itself? Okay. Number two, did she come in with that condition? Like hypertension. If you start with hypertension, you think it's going to get better during pregnancy? No. Things escalate during pregnancy because the increased blood volume in the cardiac system is like 45%. You have all this fluid is going to get worse. Okay. And then again, is she in an environmental, like, is she a, what kind of, what kind of work does she do? Is she around things that could be teratogens that can affect mom and fetus? Um, and then what about our own lifestyles? Okay. You know, we did, we went over a lot of, we need to educate these women on and we got to find out, does she have a lifestyle that's pretty negative on the effects? And we talked about adolescent nutrition and we talked about people um, like maybe working in an environment that maybe a painter, you know, there's a lot of women out there doing all kinds of different work today that could be a teratogen. All right, let's go on. All right. So as a nurse, we have some responsibilities. Yes, we do. We have one that we got to prepare this patient for any of these tests. You don't want her to come into an ambulance and thesis and not what to expect. Fear is worse than, okay? So I always want to educate my patient. Number two, the patient has the right to know. What's the reason for this test? If you're going to put this big old spinal needle into my uterus, I definitely want to know why you're going to do that. And then clarifying your in, interpreting results. Now, a lot of the times the physicians will come in and they'll get results, but it goes right over your patient's head. And you can normally see that by their expression, their nonverbal behavior. Remember, nonverbal talks louder than verbal. Okay, and just keep that down because you'll remember that for the rest of your nursing career because you got to pick up on clues. All right, so if remember I said last week, if all my teaching can be wonderful, but if it goes right over her head and she don't get any of it, it's not it's not good. So what I want to do is make sure that I give the right right things. All right, so these are some big danger signs in pregnancy. All right, and I I, I kind of made this slide come off the screen a little bit, all right? By putting in yellow and red. This is important. You will see this again. So what do you got? Well, a danger sign is something that, hello, this is not good. So having a sudden gush of fluid from the vagina, that's not good because that's spontaneous rupture membranes. All right, vaginal bleeding, okay? Why is she bleeding? She's only in the first trimester. Oh my goodness, something's going on. Why? Okay. Then you got abdominal pain. In the first trimester, abdominal pain, right low, right lower quadrant pain is etopics. That's never good. Okay, that's an etopic. Persistent vomiting. That's a clue for what? Hyperemesis gravidarum. Excessive vomiting. Okay, so we're going to have like the nausea and vomiting that's related to what? Related to the estrogen and progesterone, right? Remember that? Okay. But this is persistent vomiting. Never good. Epigastric pain. This is pain that's on the upper um, right quadrant and is right on, on a woman is right underneath that right breast. And that is indicative of the worst sign, the worst sign for preeclampsia, guys. When your patient has preeclampsia and she's sick and all of a sudden she says, you know, I got this really pain uh, nurse in my, oh, my right upper, right here, right below my breast. That's epigastric. That's related to worsening sign related, related to preeclampsia. Okay. If she has edema of her face and hands, 
That's what? Preeclampsia. That's when it first shows up. You see the face gets really, really full and the hands get swollen. Now the hands get swollen too. You can start to get what we call carpal tunnel syndrome there too. And then you got a severe persistent headache. Okay, that's preeclampsia. Not good. And then you have blur vision of dizziness, preeclampsia. Blur vision. I've had patients where they would say this to me. They saw the spots before their eyes. And they would say, you know, you got bugs in here. I said, what do you mean? Tell me more about that. Oh, yeah. I said, how many bugs you see? I said, yeah, I see some bugs. They're off they're flying around. She's got spots before her eyes. All right, I called the physician right away. We we had to monitor that, that magnesium sulfate. Okay. Um, chills with fever. Yeah, 100 points, uh, what, four or greater is not good. We don't want our patient to have septicemia or, or any kind of infection because mom gets sick, fetus gets sick. And then you have painful urination um, or reduced urine output. Yeah, we don't want, remember, when the bladder gets inflamed, it makes that uterus really cranky, okay? All right, so I hope you've been just jotting these down as I went through them because um, you'll need them. Because see, we want a beautiful, healthy baby inside that beautiful pregnant woman. All right, so here's your first test we're going to talk about. It's called the amniocentesis. And what it is, is the removal of amniotic fluid from the uterus. So this is a pretty good drawing, and it's, on, it's in your book on page 85. And um, it shows you where the needle's going in. So we're going to do this under ultrasound guidance, okay, because this um, has its risk. The reason why they do an amniocentesis in the beginning of pregnancy is to um, get a chromosomal analysis. So just jot that down. Amniocentesis in first trimester is for chromosomal analysis, okay? What Especially is that one more time? Chromo what? Chromosomal analysis. I'm looking, I'm doing analysis of the chromosomes. Yeah, especially if you have a woman who's advanced maternal age and, you know, she wants to know if, if everything's okay, all right? Do I, because then they, have, they can make decisions as to what, to keep the baby or not, all right? So this is what they're going to do in the beginning. Now, on can the Ms. other um, hand. Ms. Dunham? Yeah. Can you type that word in the chat, the um, chrom chromosome yeah, analysis? Can, I think yeah, I got you, it, but. Yeah, you can do, um, or the karyotype, you can put karyotype, um, K-A-R-O-T-Y-P-E. There we go. Okay, you got it? Yeah, I was saying in case if someone couldn't hear, because I got it, I just like did my best to spell it out, but. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, can I, uh, can I move on? You got it now? You got the chromosome analysis or the karyotyping? Yeah, what they want to know is they got a baby that um, has, down, has, has um, an abnormality, you know. And um, especially with the advanced maternal age, that this could happen. All right. Now, let me tell you also, because you're going to have to need to know this, is that amniocentesis can be done in the, it, later on, the third trimester. And the reason why we do that is for the LS, LS ratio well, or fetal lung maturity. Because I got to know if I'm going to deliver a baby that's early in the gestation, I need to know how the lungs are. And they do an amniocentesis for that reason, for lung maturity of the newborn, of the fetus. Okay, so I just wanted to give you that information. All right, so you can see how it's kind of risky to do an amniocentesis. Everything, any test you have will have risk, okay? But you always weigh the benefits, all right? So that's how you make ethical decisions. So again, this slide just goes over exactly what I said. And so what we wanna know is another word, fetal um, genetic diagnosis, karyotype and chromosomes. And there's, the, there's your term chromosome abnormality, C-H- R-O-M, 
O-S-O-M-E-S, chromosomes. Yeah. All right. Now you have to wait at least until the uterus is what? Outside. You know, it moves up. It can't, you can't do an amia when the uterus is down in the pelvis. It has to now rise above the sympathous pubis for you to get in there and to insert this needle. Okay. Again, it comes with big risk, but um, you know, it's it's another test that we can do to determine what the mom should do. Okay, so I got a little brain teaser for you. You ready? All right. So we have, I have a client and she expresses concerns related to, oh, I got this nausea. And she's in the first trimester of pregnancy. Oh, so wh which recommendation should the yes, nurse Lord. make? Remember, when you have nausea and vomiting, the nausea related to the um, hormonal changes, a lot okay. of times, I'll tell the patient, before you get up, lift your head up off that bed, eat a few crackers. And so that would be something that is, is easy to tell the patient. Yeah, before you lift your head off the bed, eat some crackers. Okay? I don't want to lie, make her lie down. No, that would not help when the nausea occurs. And eat for, more frequently. That wouldn't help either because you just vomit more. Right? Yeah. And void items, food items containing ginger. No, because ginger is good for nausea. It's one of the things we use um, to combat nausea using a non pharmacological means. All right. So eat the crackers while still in bed. I tell you, from my own standpoint, I don't know about you, but I had nausea and vomiting in, in my pregnancy. And before I lift my head off the pillow, what did I do? I ate the crackers. Okay, so there you go. Remember that. All right, so here are your pregnancy-related complications. So we're gonna talk about hypermesis gravidarum. That's a severe nausea, okay? This one doesn't stop at 14 weeks. This complication goes all the way to term with you. Oh, I had a patient in labor. And she was a severe hyperemesis. And I tell you what, plus her heart, she vomited that baby out because she couldn't, she just was so sick. She just said, oh, I'm so over this. And so I had her pushing. And when she was pushing, she just, anything that was in her, her gut, you know, it was just, everything was just com and coming out. And it was clear too, because nothing was really in there. And she just, that, that pushing down with the vomiting really helped. We had a baby, ah, you know, whatever it takes. Then you have bleeding disorders and we're gonna talk about hypertension and then we're gonna end up with blood incompatibility. Okay, so here. So these are things I want you to remember. Hypermesis is excessive nausea and vomiting. Excessive, okay. Now, because she has excessive nausea and vomiting, it can impact fetal growth, absolutely. Those babies can be small, SGA, small for gestational age. Mommy gets dehydrated. If she gets dehydrated, what, what, what can get affected by dehydration is the uterus. Because the uterus is made of three different muscle fibers. Does muscle need hydration? Yes. Yes. Remember, if you're outside and working in the heat or running in the heat, you're, you get all tensed up, what happens? Your muscles start to what? Quiver. Okay, same thing happens with the uterus. So she gets dehydrated. So she can start to go into preterm labor. She could lose this baby at any moment during this condition. And then because she has dehydration and she's got this loss of fluid from vomiting all the time, she's, she's losing what? The circulatory. And so she has the decrease in blood circulating. Now you have decreased blood circulating, you have a decrease in oxygen. But remember, RBCs, right, carry oxygen to all the cells and to the nutrients to the fetus. So this will affect the fetus quite a bit. Can you see the relationship of the cause and effect? Something cause it, you have an effect. Cause and effect. Okay. All right. Makes sense. All right. Let's move on. 
Okay, so what are you gonna do as a nurse? Well, these patients come in and I tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get an IV in them real quick, okay? Real quick and give them and give her IV fluids. And then maybe give her some anti-emetic drugs. Um, a good one is what, Reglan? Um, another one, Oridostrum, which is uh, what, Reglan? That's Reglan. Oh, uh, no, that's um, Zofran. So Zofran, Reglan, those are the, are the good drugs. They really do help. They may have, you may see Finnegan um, once in a while. That's a good drug too. It's an old drug, but it's a good drug. And I think you have assimilation with, um, with that. So, you know, you'll, you'll be prepared to know those drugs. Okay. All right, so that was hypermesis in a nutshell. All right, so now we're gonna go into bleeding disorders of early pregnancy. Now highlight early pregnancy, all right? So what, it, what, what, what is this early pregnancy? Well, it's called an abortion or miscarriage. We, we kind of group it into what? Um, the term abortion. <clears throat> But sometimes when you talk to patients, I don't like that term. I'll be honest with you, I like the term miscarriage. So you have different types. So you have the threatened, the inevitable. That means you can't do nothing about it. It's going to happen. Incomplete, complete, everything is evacuated. And you got the miss and the recurrent. Now go to your page. Your book has a really nice um, picture of these different types of miscarriages, okay? And when I talk about in Emerville, it means the, um, it, it, you can't stop it. You know, the membranes have ruptured and the contents, the cervix is dilated. Remember I told you, you know, once they get dilated, there's no, there's no going back. Okay, now a threaded one, that one, she got a little bit of spotting, you know, and she may have a little backache. So that's what we call threat. So what are you going to do with something's threading? I'm going to maybe decrease the stimulation, you know, no, no, nothing in the vagina and put it to bed rest. Let's see if we can get over this little time of this little bleeding episode. Okay. That's a threaded. Um, a complete, you mean everything, like I said, everything comes out. Um, and then the incomplete, you have ruptured membranes. Um, the some products of conception are expelled. On that, you need to have a DNC. Okay, you got to do it. And the DNC is called um, is a dilatation and curatage. Is a surgery um, where we go in and we dilate the cervix, and then we use what we, it looks like a big old vacuum. You know, it's a suction. And we have a big, long yank R. And what we do, we hook that up to the um, suction and we have, we, and the doctor goes in and sucks all the, the contents out. Okay. All right. So we're going to clean, clean it out. Okay. All right. So here's a picture right from your book, like I told you, and that was right on page 89. All right. So nursing care of early pregnancy bleeding disorders. What are you gonna do? Well, somebody's starting to bleed, you wanna know the amount and the character. So what am I mean by character? Describe the blood, how much? And I always tell my patients, save anything that looks like a clot or tissue. Sometimes they come into the clinic and they'll uh, be uh, threatened. And I'll say, so we send them home with a sterile container and say bed rest, and uh, nothing in the vagina. And let's see, let's get through some time. We take every day at a time. And then if she starts to bleed more, then I used to tell them, um, be sure that when you go to the bathroom and on the toilet, that whatever comes out looks like a, a, a anything, tissue um, or a clot, save it. Put it into this little container. And what we'll do, we'll go ahead and um, set an orthopathology. Okay, now she comes back into the through the ER. I'm going to tell them NPO because here she's coming in with this little jar. She's got to have the D DNC done. Okay, all right. It's not a nice time. It's very sad because some of these women have been trying, trying, trying for what? For pregnancy. 
Okay. Now, post-abortion teaching, um, you want to report um, any, any more um, bleeding. I take a temperature and monitor temperature because monitor for at least um, eight hours for three days. And they may have to take some um, iron because I don't want to get infected. That's why I take their temperature. And I want to get some iron because they lost a lot of blood. And then uh, come back to us for a checkup. And then we talk, we talk about, you know, contraception or whatever they need all over again. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not an easy time at all. So we give a lot of emotional care and we give some spiritual support and uh, make sure that if they're in the hospital and they're needing spiritual report, we have chaplains and rabbis and everybody that we can get. Um, they have to go. They have to go through the grieving process. Everybody, um, they lost the pregnancy. They lost the baby, and um, it's it, it's it's very emotional. Now, here's your brain teaser. Okay, so a woman, if she's eight weeks pregnant, and she calls to report cramping and a small amount of vaginal bleeding. What condition should the nurse consider? E. Right, an abortion. Boy. So B as in boy. Mm -hmm. Right. So you see what I did you see the words I, I put in red? These mm -hmm. are this is how this is how I want you to read these maternity questions. She's eight weeks pregnant. Okay. <coughs> she, she's giving some cramping and a small amount of vaginal bleeding. Okay, small. All right. That means that we don't have dilation. We don't have ruptured membranes. We just have a small. So it means the cervix is still closed. So she's a threaded uh, uh, um, abortion. Okay. All right. I have a question. So now, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry, before you move on from it. So yeah. I'm looking at this picture um, on page 90. It's, okay. it's a... Oh, yes. Hida, Tita form mole. What, yes. like, what is that? I'm going to get to there. That's called a molar pregnancy. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, Go we're going to get to that. That's another complication, and I'll get to that. So okay. before I get to that, let me just go over each topics. Okay? okay. All right. So remember that pain I told you in the left, on the uh, right lower quadrant? Um, if they, oh, they call your clinic, and they say, oh, nurse, oh, Michelle, I'm in so much pain. And she's the first question she's going to ask was, when was your last menstrual period? And the patient states, was, oh, I think it was like maybe eight weeks ago, maybe seven. I don't know. About eight, you know. Okay. So first of all, she, she hasn't had a period. Second of all, she's having pain in that right lower quadrant. And it's significant pain. So what is Michelle, the nurse, going to tell this woman to do? Come in. Go to the hospital. The sooner she gets to the hospital, she goes to the ER, they'll do an ultrasound and they can see if it's a neat topic. The sooner you get intervention, okay, the better it is for her. Because if there's any waiting period, the pain get, all the pain is going to get worse. It increases. And what happens is that this little, this little zygote that's going through the tube, remember we talked about that? He gets stuck. He's stuck in there, okay? And so what happens, you still got cell dividing. You got all the cell division going on. He doesn't know any better. He's stuck. And it just keeps growing in that tube. But that tube is not very wide. Okay. So he is you're actually stretching that tube open. Okay. And that's why she gets so much pain. Goes, oh my goodness, what's going on down there? It's because it's it's stretching that tube. So we want to get her to the hospital, get diagnosed, because we can do interventions such as give her some methotrexate. It's a cancer um, medication that we give to what? To, to wipe out the cancer, to wipe out those cells, to get in there and it breaks it up and then it gets reabsorbed into the system. All right, she doesn't lose her, lose her tube. If you wait and she doesn't go to the hospital and she's like sitting home with this pain, she can get a uterine rupture and that's what can happen. It can rupture. What happens? She loses the tube. 
All right, so we don't want young women to lose their tubes over this. So we wanna get her to the hospital as soon as, as soon as possible. That's why Michelle asked those questions, being the nurse answering the phone at the clinic says, okay, you gotta get to the hospital because I'm thinking right away she could have a topic. Now, what happens is sometimes these tubal deformities are come from maybe an inflammation in the past, you know, chlamydia is a sexual transmitted infection that can ruin, can cause damage to the tubes. Um, you can have adhesions in the tubes and you can be born with a tube defect and you could also have endometriosis in the tube. And that's very painful. So where did this happen? You can see here the most common sites for etopic pregnancy. Okay, so we want again, intervention. All right. And this slide just goes over everything I just said. Um, again, the pain. She does have a little bit of light vaginal bleeding, but not very much, but pain. And you can see that the tube ruptures and then your treatment. Okay. So yes, all these losses, pregnancy losses, cause her to grieve. And they have to be treated as such, okay? It doesn't matter if they had a spontaneous abortion, miscarriage, etopic pregnancy, um, it, it's still, they lost the pregnancy, they lost the baby. So they have to have time to breathe. All right, here is a good slide on the signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. Now you can use this for your med search too, okay? leave out the first one, the fetal heart, heart tones, but this happens in all hypovolemic patients. The first thing we'll notice, because we have a we have a fetus, is that the fetal heart rate changes, okay? You can have an increase, decrease, you can have baby getting very low variability. Things are changing because mom is depleted. Mom's going into shock. So what happens, your first sign is tachycardia. The heart rate will go up, all right? It's real tacky. Then you have tachypnea because she's trying to compensate. She knows that something's happened to the body. And then all of a sudden your respirations kind of what? They kind of get very shallow and irregular. We call that a term called air hunger. Now, you have hypotension. Blood pressure's gone down. And I guess you see from some of these medical medical TV shows where they say, oh, the pulse is 130, her blood pressure is 80 over 40. What, and what do, you, what do you think? Shock, right? So you can even watch TV and, and come up and, 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 and realize the patient's in shock. Okay, and then you have the, the kid, and then the body systems. The body systems, everything starts to shut down because it's sending, trying to send more blood to the heart and the brain to keep what? Everything going. So that's why your kidneys start to shut down. Um, you have very pale or mucous membranes and the skin is cold and clammy. And um, the, you know, of course they're gonna be very uh, fainty, then they're gonna be like lethargic on you. So that's a really good slide of what we call hypovolemic shock. What's the first sign you're gonna see? Tachycardia. Okay. And then tachycardia, and then you got tachypnea, and then hypotension. Hypotension. All right. So here's that beautiful hydiniform mole, or we know it as gestational tropoblastic disease or molar pregnancy. Okay. Now, what happens is that, you know, remember the developmental embryonic stage? That thing was like cell dividing and, and, and forming. Well, here, the signals got really crisscross and nothing, nothing, the fetus did not form. And so what it did, it, but it didn't know any better. So it keeps what? Cell dividing because um, the chorionic villi just keeps what? Increasing. And I put another picture here too. And there's a, another picture in your book, um, page 90. And it looks like, a bunch of grapes, all right? So the so, fetus doesn't, the fetus is not 
forming. At this point, it's just a bunch of cells, looks like grapes, but no baby. You got it. Okay. So what happens is that the woman, she's secreting HCG, the human gametronic hormone. She's secreting that, okay? So she says, oh, I'm pregnant. Okay, so she makes her appointment with her OB doctor. She goes in for her ultrasound and they do the ultrasound and there's no heartbeat. No heartbeat. And so what, what they're looking at is just a bunch of cells. All right. Now that is traumatic because you could you imagine having your family in the room with you and everybody's waiting to see the little bait, the fetus, and there's no heart rate. That's why um, when we see the heart rate, um, we're going, yes, there's the heart rate. We love to see that little heart just flickering in there. And you can see a little, see the little chambers going doo, 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 like here, like this. But it's such a bad thing when you don't see the heart rate. And you can see that. All it is, it's just a bunch of cells. All right. So I got I put another picture in here for you to see. This is a pretty good picture, too. And all these things it causes can cause her to hemorrhage, um, have some clotting abnormalities, um, maybe even some hypertension. And down the line, folks. A patient like this has to be followed. So what are we going to do? So we're going to put, we got to, we got to put her in for a DNC. Okay. DNC. We have to evacuate the uterus. And uh, we, she, can, she doesn't get pregnant for a whole year. She's got to be on strict birth control for a whole year. She's got to give the body time to what? readjust all these hormones and everything. Um, also, this kind of patient, we have to watch out as she gets older, she's, she is at high risk for a uterine um, cancer. So this lady is, gets watched through her young reproductive years. All righty, um, hang in there for about 15 more minutes and we'll take a break. Okay, so that was a hygieniform mole. And um, main thing is she can't get pregnant and um, she has to have a DNC. And um, again, there was no heart rate when they did the ultrasound, just, just some cells. Now I'm gonna tell you when this becomes really dramatic. I mean, it's always dramatic, but even more so. It's when you have, like I had a patient that was had infertility issues. And so she was trying so hard to get pregnant. And so they did the little test and it came positive for HCG. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm pregnant. And so she was really, you know, wanting to get in and to get an ultrasound done. And then um, this was discovered. Now, also, this type of patient, the HCGs escalate very quickly. They increase. I mean, they're like tripling and quadrupling. And because why? Because there's nothing forming. It's just a bunch of cells that have been, what? Read the cell division. Boom, 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 boom. So it's firing, firing, firing. If HCG levels go up real high. So that's what we have to watch too after she has her DNC is that we have to monitor HCG levels. And we do that for a whole year. All right, everybody good on that? Can I move on to bleeding disorders of late pregnancy? Now, we all that was all early. Got it? Now we're going to go into late. All right. So we could have placenta previa, folks. And that just means that, you know, the placenta normally is up high in, on the posterior wall, right? It's, up, it's not by the cervix. Placenta previa is where the placenta migrated down and plant itself near or completely covering the internal os. Now, when you have a placenta and you got those pictures I gave you of the placenta and that's covering the internal os of the cervix, that's, that is very significant. Now, she will bleed and she has like, she has what we call painless bleeding. So write down placenta previa, 
painless bleeding. It is bright red. Why is it bright red? Because it's right over the internal os. So if she contracts just a little bit, it's going to bleed. All right. So she's got bright red bleeding, fresh, fresh blood, and it's painless. Now you have different degrees of placenta previa. I just described to you the complete that laying right over that internal loss, or you could have marginal, which is like 2.5 centimeters from the internal loss, or partial, just gets a little bit closer to the os. So you have these different placenta previas. They are, you have to have, you have your patient on bed rest. I had one lady that was in the hospital with me a long time because uh, she, she bled every so often. So we couldn't send her home. And these kind of patients, you do not, listen to me, you do not want them to contract. Because when they contract, they bleed more. Because when you have a contraction, it's starting to, what, to open up that internal loss. It opens, that's what the whole power of contractions do. And so we don't want that because that previa, that placenta is laying right over that internal loss. She'll bleed. She'll bleed a lot. All right. So we don't want these kind of patients to, one, they don't have a vaginal delivery. They, they, are, they are delivered by cesarean. And they don't, we don't want them to have contractions. Will this patient most likely be on bed rest for the rest of their pregnancy? Like very yeah. high bed rest if they've experienced Yeah, that? we try to keep um, them pretty, you know, calm, cool, and collective. Um, if they're home, you know, they have to be aware they can't lift anything heavy, like go grocery shopping. You know, their, their life has changed a little bit. Um, if they're a single mom, this really impacts when, when we have a single mom and she's got placenta previa. Because she, one, she has nobody at home. So we have to make sure that she has someone home with her. And the other one is who she can't work. So these are things that start to get real complicated when you have these kinds of complications in pregnancy. They really is this you put a seclusion. Sorry. No, 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 you can't put a seclusion because the seclage is a stitch that's used for incompetent cervix that means that the, the cervix has opened up but the placenta is where it should be on the upper portion of the uterus it's not in the way so what you want to do with the incompetent cervix is we do a mcdonald stitch and we sew them up and those seclages work very very well to get them to at least 36 weeks gestation this is something totally different okay okay all right now that was placenta previa. And here's a nice little picture showing you the placenta. So remember the placenta should be where? Should be up okay. higher, right? And here you see the placenta, it's right there, right over that cervix. And remember, remember the picture I gave you the placenta? Keep that in mind. That big old hunky look of liver, it looks like liver to me, um, is laying right over that internal os. And so if she, think, think of this, if she contracts, can you see that os starting to open up? And yeah. if the os opens up, what happens? She bleeds more, okay? So we don't want contractions. No, we do not want contractions. Ms. Dunn, have I had a question? Yes. There was a clue in this chapter, and I think it was around the reading of that. And it said that if, you, if a woman's nipples are like stimulated, that oxytocin is released and it causes contraction. Is that true? Yes. Ah. <laughs> yes okay, and we'll get we'll see yeah. that in there. oh yeah nipple stimulation causes the release of oxytocin from the anterior pituitary and it's so um, it, it does make you contract because that's what we use we use a synthetic um version of oxytocin called pitocin to stimulate contractions or do an induction of labor okay yeah good question so how about a brain teaser hint hint brain teaser the pregnant client has a diagnosis of placenta previa. So when reviewing interventions with her, you're the nurse, you're going over the interventions, which would not be appropriate for this patient? B not. as a boy. Yes. You got it. Okay. So do you see how I put not in red? I, that's how you're going to read these questions. Okay. So yes. 
because we're going to do a probably a weekly biophysical profile because we're going to watch the fetus. Um, we're going to have um, bed rest, like Mo said, bed rest with bathroom privileges. That means she can get up, go to the bathroom and go back to bed. All right. Um, and then we always have, we're always ready for cesarean because at any time, I'm going to be honest with you, anytime these patients can bleed. All right. So let's go into our other lovely condition, and that's called abruptio placenta, or placenta that is abrupted. And so what happens is that the placenta is in the normal place, but instead of staying there like it's supposed to be a good little placenta, it breaks away from the wall of the intermetrium, the wall of the intermetrium, which is your lining of the uterus. It breaks away. When it breaks away, it's going to cause pain. So down by a placenta abruption, put pain. You're going to have pain. There's no doubt about it. And it's dark red bleed. Dark. Dark red means that part of it is old blood. When you see dark, it means it's been laying up there a little bit and then it slubs down. So that's the difference. Okay. The other one, placenta previa, was what? Right, because it's fresh. The dark is higher up. So it's taking a little longer to come down through the uterus because to come out the os. So it's going to be dark red. All right. And, and you so, might not always see that, right? Like you might not well, always see that not, because no. it's inside the uterus. You'll just, the, the, right. will it become swollen? Right. It'd be a call a cult placenta abruptio. Now, what, what you'll see when your patient comes in, Jessica, is a board-like abdomen. It's hard. It's okay. like a board. So you lay, So she comes in, she's oh. got this dark red bleeding, and she's in pain. Write that down. She's exhibiting pain. Oh, my gosh. And you put her on the monitor, and the fetal heart rate is down, like to 90. And then... She, you look at her abdomen and you can see it. It's actually changing shape and it becomes hard. Now you think, well, how does that happen? It's because it's abrupting off the wall of the endometrium. So it's going to make that abdomen just fill up with more blood. And so when, the ab when, when her uterus fills up with all this blood, it causes to be what? Hard. hard. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So that's where you see it. And so um, I don't do any kind of badge exam. I get my doctor in there and we, we what we call a code, um, you know, abruption where the team comes in. We have our own team in labor delivery and we get her back to the OR. Because if you don't do a stats C-section, your baby can die. Now you probably think what would cause an abrupt, a, a placenta to come off? Well, she was in a car accident or she got hit in the stomach if she has um, was in some violence, um, if somebody hit her in the, in, and gave her a good punch, it's called trauma, trauma to the abdomen, to her uterus. Cocaine and, too. Huh? The co cocaine, cocaine is a- Oh yeah, out. cocaine is a big one. Cocaine is another one. Yep. Because cocaine is what? It's like a stimulant, right? And so it causes that, that placenta to be able to come right off. So here you go. Here are some of your predisposing factors for abruptio. And there you are. You've got hypertension. So your preeclamptic patients are very much prone to abruption. Um, your cocaine or alcohol patients, like you said. Cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking, big time. Or if you have somebody who's not eating poor nutrition. And then you got, I said, blows the abdomen. She could be a, a woman that is experiencing intimate partner violence. And so he gives her a big old jab to the abdomen. Okay. Um, if she has any kind of prior history, then we, we, we are, uh, she had an abruption with her first baby and she's now having her second baby where um, red flagged her. Okay, and then of course, if she has any kind of folic deficiency, it can cause an abruption. All right. So here's your brain teaser. You have a 33 week, 
pregnant woman and she's in the emergency department and she has painless vaginal bleeding, what nursing action is contraindicated? Perform a vaginal exam. Yeah, you, got one. Yeah. you got it. Yeah, you never on on. So what 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 does what is this describing? This question is describing what? Previa. Listen to Berkson. It no painless. Opening up. Placenta previa. Placenta previa. And with placenta previa, when you got a placenta over that internal lodge, you never put your fingers in to do a vaginal exam. Why you say? It's because so, when I enter when I enter my fingers into the uterus, I can be touching that placenta and I can be causing contraction and I can make her bleed a lot. So we keep our fingers out, hands off with placenta previous. What am I gonna do? Well, I would go ahead and prepare for a C-section. Okay. Um, inform her that she must meet may she has to be on bed rest. We talked about that already. And then I could give her now she's preemie. Uh, you could administer bethamethasone, but we'll get to that. Okay. So which one is contraindicated? Putting your Definitely fingers in the hand. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Why don't we take? It's four o'clock. Why don't we take um, a, a little ten minute break? All right, because we've got a lot to go through. Um, but I want to tell you something. Pain is your important symptom that distinguishes between abruptio placentae and placenta previa. That's where it comes in, okay? Placenta previa is painless, bright red bleed. Abruptio is painful because the uterus is filling up with blood and it causes a lot, a lot of pain, okay? All right, have a, have a little break and come right back. Don't take yourself off Zoom though, because Zoom will, um take away some time from you okay all right how long we have um <laughs> 10 minutes but okay come back whatever you want you know, as soon as you can go to the bathroom and get something to drink <laughs> okay all right all right <laughs> miss dunham are we doing the quiz today yes five o'clock mm -hmm. all righty that's why i want to keep on going <laughs> Miss Dunham, do you care if I see that nursing tip slide again so I can write that down, please? I'm sorry, I stepped away. What you need? Oh, you're okay. I was just wondering if you could click back to that nursing tip slide so I could write that down. Oh, the nursing tip? Oh, yes, okay. ma'am. All right, let's see. Oh, my nursing tip. This one here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, this is a good one. That's why I put it really big. <laughs> Thank you. Give me just you're one welcome. second. Okay. Yeah, and then in your HESI book, let me just tell you, I looked it up, page 214, you got a great mm -hmm. comparison a placenta previa and a brachial placenta. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Yeah, yeah, your HESI book has it really good. I got it. Thank you.
How are you doing, Jessica? You okay? You're on mute. No, I'm here. I was just reading some um, some uh, announcements from my professor. Absolutely. Always read those announcements. Okay, so earlier I did the review. I like doing the reviews every week. And I did yeah. it earlier with Professor P. And now yeah. she can't do it on Mondays anymore. She's doing it on Wednesdays. And so I told her, I said, that was my issue. I said, I, with my professors that you do it on a day I have clinical. She's doing it on another day I have clinical. So I'm trying to find out, is there another, um, I mean, I don't mind watching the recording, but I love the part of where we interact with one another. Sure, sure. Um, so what about Thursday? Um, my Thursday, I have, let's see, this week I have till three, see, I'm in labs until 3.30 and then my clinicals, I'm not, I don't have an open to be able to do it on a Thursday until the 23rd of February and then my Thursdays are open. Wow. How about, um, I'm doing an exam review on Friday. Are you able to do Friday? I have mid surge. But I already, I already picked it up to do it for that Saturday at 7.30 with another professor. Like okay. I figured, okay. you know what, at the oh. end of the day, if I can get in with somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody. That's okay. You just can't, wanna... you just can't um, uh, have a lecture on that kind of, you know, that, that right. kind of day. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's no big deal. If I can show up anywhere to anybody's class to do it, you know what I mean? I, it doesn't matter as long as I get it with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I usually do um, weekly review on Thursday, unfortunately. And then um, and Friday I do exam reviews. Right. But um, uh, what are you, what time are you done on Friday? Uh, Fridays I am done at between 12.45 and like 1.15. Okay, then you can attend Friday at two o'clock. Oh, is that your reviews? Yes. Okay, so hold on, let me put that in there. So like, yeah, exam review, and I'm starting this Friday. Um, exam review at 2 p.m. Sure can. Review. We'll get you ready for next Tuesday. Wait, what is today? 24th. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, today's 24th. Yeah, we're, yeah it's going quick. It's going quick. Yeah, I know. You, you, you're taking med surge and med surge, you know, it's not well, easy. I got thrown off because I have an exam on, for med surge on that Friday, too. Oh, at what time? No, uh, no. At like nine in the morning, nine to 12 45. Oh. Yeah, you'll, you'll be back. You'll be fine. Take a little break, have a little lunch, and come um, for the exam review on Friday afternoon at two p.m. Okay, oh. I'll send it. I'll send you all um, uh, either announcement or inbox, and um, oh, give you the Zoom number. Um, I have a question. So will the will the review be re um, recorded because I have class on Friday at that time? Yeah, I I, I usually. Um, we record all my my lectures okay yeah i yeah. i have oh i have old recordings too you want to listen to those <laughs> miss dunham yeah can you yes. hear me yeah i do i see you too hi okay yeah i have i have a question maybe it was wrong but i have just received like an email uh, about changing the, um about zoom what? class from tuesday to thursday um, that's for Professor P. Oh, because it had a time for you and her. Oh, yeah. She's she's going to send you out like a schedule of exam reviews. No. Okay. Yeah. And that's like, I'm in clinical. Oh, yeah. So we know that you got lab clinical sins. And we know that you take other subjects. So what we do is we go ahead and we all, I pick, we all pick a day. Okay, then number two is we, we will record all of ours, 
and then we will put it on in Canvas for you. Like I, I did YouTube for you and I put it under announcement. You got that one. I, I know it's there. Um, yeah, but I mean, I can forward you, but this one says the Zoom dates are changing as of February 1st. That's what this, that's what this is. And it says that it starts Thursday for you at three. Yes, that's called a weekly review. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to just make sure. Like PNR two oh three point two is Tuesday from three to five thirty. That's your lecture. That's your live lecture. Then I'm also doing a weekly review and I'm doing that on Thursday. Okay. And, yeah. And then I'm doing the exam review for you too on Friday. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted some clarification. Oh yeah, no problem. A anytime. You know, guys, you can reach out to me. You know, I check my canvas every day, like five times a day. Okay. Even more. I can't go by my computer without checking it. So um, you just reach out to me. Now you all have my cell. If you, um, if you send me an inbox basket and you don't see me answering you, just send me a text. Say I sent you a, a message in canvas. Yeah, no problem. I don't mind that at all. What time is the exam review for Friday? 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go back um, on so we can get through this because um, there's no way I'm going to get through all of it, but I want to go ahead and make sure I, I give you what you need. So um, what are, how are you going to take care of this woman with excessive bleeding? Well, just like you take care of any med surge patient, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? We got to we gotta always chart our, our blood loss, always. And with, with pregnancy, it's just it's just a lot. It's greater because we have 45% more blood volume than normally. Um, you're always going to check and make sure for vital signs. Always. Because why? Because I'm checking for a hypo, hypo. I don't want my patient going to hypovolemic shock. I'm going to do an INO on this patient because I want to know the kidneys are working. Because again, what am I worried about? Organ failure. I'm going to observe for pain. And another thing with um, placenta abruptio with excessive bleeding is I want to look at her abdomen. Remember I said, if she's got a placenta abruptio, she's going to have uterine, what? Rigidity, rigidity. That means the uterus is rigid, board-like. Those are um, descriptors that you may see. And when you see those descriptors, what are you going to think? Placenta abruption. All right. Um, you're always gonna when you get when you have this kind of patient, you're always gonna do a CBC and how about type and cross? Always gonna blood type or cross it's called type and cross, and we usually get about four units of blood. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have an IV in her. You better believe it. Okay. And I'm going to watch that IV site because let me tell you, if you got an IV site that she's bleeding from. <clears throat> it's not a good sign. That is if your first sign that your patient is going into DIC, disseminated coagulation coagulopathy. So DIC, just write DIC for now. It is excessive bleeding. And then you're going to prepare for surgery. Got to do a SAS C section. You got an abruptio, you better believe it. Uh, monitor fetal heart rate and contractions. Yes, because the percent, either one of them, I don't want her contract because one, she's in so much pain that that uterus is rigid that to have a contractions would cause what? Worse. Okay. Would make the placenta really come off more and uh, she, she could die very quickly. With placenta previa, I don't ever want her contracting because she can, she'll hemorrhage, she'll bleed out on you because the uterus then would start to what? The internal os would open up and there's the placenta. They, you know, remember, babies can die because of these conditions. Okay, so this is why it's so important to have your team all ready to go. And we did in labor and delivery, we had our own team. And of course, you're gonna give oxygen by mass, face mass, not nasal cannula. Oh, and, and, and maternity, we don't, we don't fool around with nasal cannula. Okay, <laughs> no way. Okay, so let me move right on and go into our lesson 5.2. And these are our objectives. So we're gonna do some, we're gonna talk more about complications and how we can how we how we handle them. Okay, so here we're moving down the line. We go to hypertension. 
hypertension during pregnancy. So it's, it's known as gestational hypertension. All right. So we got preeclampsia and eclampsia. Now, preeclampsia is when you have a patient that has what? A, a increased blood, um, blood pressure. She's got protein in her urine. She has what? Hyperreflexive. Her re reflexes are hyper. They could be go up to four plus. She is may have reflexes? with preeclampsia. She has hyperreflexia. Okay. So these are pretty bad, right? Preeclampsia. She could have a bad headache. Let me tell you, bad headaches, severe headaches, not good. They come in and they got dark sunglasses on and they're holding their head like this. And you go, oh my gosh, you take a blood pressure real quick. And she is like 180 over um, 100. And she's, remember the dizziness, the, um, the spots before her eyes, all that? You got preeclampsia. Now, when they come in and they present in like this, the drug that we're going to use is called magnesium sulfate. Now that drug, we start out with four grams loading dose. That's a lot of magnesium. So remember, magnesium is a central nervous system depressant. So it's going to, so it's going to combat seizures. It's not, it, you want to get this magnesium sulfate in her quickly because I don't want my patient to have seizures. When your patient has a seizure, listen up, has a seizure, it goes into what we call eclamptic. So preeclampsia is all the symptoms I told you about. Eclampsia is all the, all the symptoms I told you about. Plus now your patient had a seizure. So now not every organ in the body is affected, including the brain. So they have a seizure once they had they've been on mag, correct? We put them on mag to prevent a seizure. But so could they one. still have one on mag? Hopefully, we gave them enough. Um, usually we give them a four gram. They can, of course. Um, that we give them a four gram loading dose. That's a lot of mag to give, and that really shuts down that central nervous system pretty quick. I mean, you have to be very, very careful when you get magnesium because you lose your deep tendon reflexes very quickly and you lose your ability to breathe in and out. Remember, is it is affecting the central nervous system. But we give it, listen up, to prevent a seizure. Now, that's always been on an exam. Uh, and has always been preeclampsia is on HESI. I can guarantee it. And they usually like to do that. And they usually always use it like drug, a tr drug given for this patient's magnesium. What, what do you have to worry about? What you got to worry about is her deep tendon reflexes and her ability to breathe. Okay. If she can't breathe, we got, our patient is what? It's got toxicity. Okay. If I try to get, um, uh, she was four plus, uh, reflexes and and all of a sudden now she's got like none. I got magnesium sulfate toxicity. Now, what do I have at bedside as to reverse that effect? Calcium gluconate. Write that down. Calcium gluconate. I tell you, when I practice, I always had calcium gluconate taped to to my my head, the head of my of the bed, because when I needed. I, I couldn't run to the pixels. I needed right there, okay? It, it happened just like that. And so, because you give a lot of magnesium. The reason why is because I don't want her to have a seizure. I tell you, when I had my patient uh, came in off the elevator and she was seizing because she was pre she was preeclamptic and then she had a seizure, so she became eclamptic. She dilated like you wouldn't believe. Boom, we got just and back in the OR to deliver that baby back in there instead of the hallway. Okay. They, they can dilate very quickly. Okay, so this um, hi, this hypertension preeclampsia usually occurs like at 20 weeks because the, the cure, guys, write this down, the cure for preeclampsia is delivery of the baby. Now we'll watch them and, you know, have them on mad 
and have all the protocols in place and, you know, and have her on a fetal monitor and we'll be watching the fetal heart rate very, very closely. Now, the magnesium, since it's a central nervous system depressant, can also de make the heart rate, the baby kind of variability to go very kind of flattish, you know, like very more minimal than moderate. So we have to worry about protein and thrombocytopenia. You know, that's low platelets. So we worry more about that. Okay. All right. So here's that 3015 rule. I kind of said that last week, so I'm not going to go over it again. But just know if the patient comes in and her blood pressure starts to what start to change on you, that means that she's starting the wrong, she's in the wrong, going the wrong direction. Okay. So she has to be watched very, very carefully. Okay. So here's your brain teaser. So you have a woman who's 35, 35 weeks pregnant and she's been diagnosed with preeclampsia. Her blood pressure is 140 over 100, one, uh, and ranging 160 over 110. No, she reports headaches. She's got the generalized edema. Remember I told you, face and hands. And she's got three plus protein in her urine. So what would be the most appropriate environment for this woman? Okay. Number two? Yes. Number two. I want to keep the stimuli down. I would never put her into um, semi-private. She doesn't need to be in the labor room because she's not in labor. So she would be on what we call FRU or our prenatal high-risk unit. Okay. That's another unit we have in the hospital. And we put these patients in a private room, very quiet, no stimulation. And there's, they, they're they able to have bathroom privilege. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do a strict INO on her. And every time she goes to the bathroom, she has to pee in that hat. You know, they have a little hat we put inside the toilet. She's got to pee in that hat so I can test for what? I can see exactly her output and I had to test for the protein. Yeah, okay. nice. They made me wear a... a, a a calf, they calfed me because I have preeclampsia really bad. And okay. they didn't even give me that option. They, they immediately, and I was like, we're, we're really doing all that. Like, I don't got enough going on down there already. Like, <laughs> so you, you, they were really worried about your kidneys not functioning. So yeah, I, I was bad. I was yeah. really, really bad. So your lab work was your creatinine and everything was, was not, not good. But that's mm -hmm. what happened. So remember, we always want to do the least inv invasive in nursing. Now, the doctor comes in and says, okay, I want to catheter in because I, I want to make sure we get every, every bit of urine on this patient. Okay, so here's your risk factors for cessational hypertension. So what do you think? Okay, guys, heads up. First pregnancy, yes. And they're young. They're like under 19 years of age. Yep. That's our like our adolescent poor little thing. And... On the other hand, you have the advanced maternal age patient who's over 35. These are two areas. And then um, we studies have shown obesity. And then if you have twins and triplets and quads, so multi-fetal. And then if you have chronic hypertension. Remember I told you about that chronic hypertension patient that she came in and she told me she had hypertension, right? And I said, we're going to red flag this lady because I'm thinking when we get down, down the line here, we're going to have a problem. Sure enough. And then, of course, diabetes can put her at risk. And anybody that has a kind of a problem with their kidneys, we call um, chronic renal um, disease, would also be proud. All right. So here's your manifestations of your and symptoms that are affected by gestational hypertension. Well, we talked about kidneys. We talked about edema. Um, the protein we know because we talked about the kidneys. Um, blood clotting. She's a free. She could be a free bleeder, and um, have very low platelets. Um, her eyes can get affected. Remember, we talked about spots and double vision. Um, respiratory system. Another one that can get um, affected by gestational hypertension, especially if you give her magnesium sulfate and GI system and liver. Liver enzymes have a tendency to go up until you have elevated liver. And then you might have what we call HELP syndrome. So write this on a piece of paper, write H-E and then L-P. You can kind of 
go down. So H stands for what? L um, hemolysis. So that means hemolysis of red blood cells. Um, the next one is, so that's H E and L P is, um, oh, H E and then elevated, oh, E L would be um, elevated liver enzymes. And then you have L P for low platelets. So that's right in your book too. It's called HELP syndrome. And so that's H E and E L E L L P. Uh huh. You got it. So what is L P? L P. Low platelets. Low platelets. Yeah, they become like a free bleeder. Go ahead, D I C. So that's hemolysis of the red blood cells. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So she got destruction. Her own body. Can you imagine this? Her own, your own body is like turning against you. And you know who the culprit is? Oh, this is go back to now. They're really researching this out. Is the placenta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why the cure is delivery. Because we're going to, when we deliver a baby, what do we also we deliver? We deliver the placenta. All right. So, but how are you going to manage? Well, I'm going to try to keep this lady, if she's got preeclampsia, to keep her from what? Going into eclampsia. So I'm going to do my management based on what, what her blood, what her symptoms are and the condition of the fetus. Okay. Then I'm going to focus on maintaining blood flow to all her vital organs. Absolutely. And what else? The placenta. Because the placenta keeps the baby going, correct? Baby needs the placenta. Okay. And then main thing too, is again, I told you about preventing convulsions. Okay. So this one tells you about um, what are you going to do? So conservative treatment, restrict her activity. Yes. If she's working, no more work, no more stress. We have to reduce all kinds of stress to this patient. Maternal assessment of fetal activity, we may have her um, come in and do non-stress tests. Non-stress tests, write this down, is a test to determine how well the baby's doing. We call it fetal well-being. And we are trying to make sure that this baby is doing okay. It's not an invasive test. We just put the monitors on mom. We put the ultrasound, uh, uh, the uh, TOCO. And we put the ultra, um, the uh, fetal heart rate ultrasound, and we pick it up. And then we'll talk about that when, next week when we get more into labor on the monitor. Okay, um, we're going to always monitor blood pressure and daily weights because I see her what retaining fluid. She's going to gain. She's going to gain weight. That's another indication that something's happening. And every time she pees, I told you this. You're going to check the protein. So we got magnesium sulfate is your drug of choice and calcium gluconate reverses the effects of magnesium. All right, let's see here. So again, nursing care, we focus on the woman. We want to make sure she, what? She's doing okay. This is why you want every woman to get prenatal care. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy having her um, have these problems with, Preeclampsia is not easy at all. You're going to change their entire their entire world. Okay, um, let's go on to the other category of complications called bleeding incompatibility. So even the word incompatibility means what? They don't go together. That's right, exactly. So what I want you to remember is that you have an Rh negative mom. Write this down. Mommy's blood type is Rh negative. And we don't know what the fetus is. So we assume or presume the fetus is positive. So that's what we call incompatibility. You know, we don't want mom's blood and fetal blood to mix, but we know sometimes it can. And so if that happens, now look at me, if that happens, so I have mom say, mom's blood's here on my right, uh, right here. This is mom. And I had the little baby right here. Okay, little baby. And here's her, her RH antibodies. 
and they're going and they kind of, you know, they're mixing, they, so they mixed, right? Okay, they kind of came together. That's not good. And so this mom, this mommy goes, oh, look at all these beautiful RBCs. Oh, look at all these beautiful erythrocytes. And what's she going to do? What's these antibodies going to do? Well, they're like, they're like little Pac-Man, you know? They got to go, ah! And they're going to try to eat them all up. And they do. They do. And so what happens to baby? He gets a low RBCs and he gets it severely anemic. Not good. So what can we give during pregnancy that this, this incompatibility, this eating up these antibodies will not eat up these RBCs here. We can Rogan. give them Rogan. And another word, let me give you another word for Rogan is called RHD immune globulin. Write that down. The reason why I'm telling you is because HESI doesn't tell you Rogan. It, it gives you the term RHD immune globulin. RHD right? like David? Yeah, RH and then in parentheses D and then immune globulin. Now that's what they do. Okay, so we just talked about how, how this happened. So in your book, you have a really good picture of this happening and you can get when the baby gets severely anemic, you can get a condition of the newborn called erythroblastosis fatalis. That's a lot of words. But what it means is the erythrocytes of the fetus is being eaten up. So what happens is we have that mixture that I just demonstrated with my hands. You saw that, okay? And so this is what happens. So we don't want this to happen, but sometimes the develop, this can develop this condition and it's very serious babies um, are severely anemic and so they have to be taken to the NICU and they have to get a transfusion and how so these, ba these babies are these survive? babies are sick babies how often do they survive though um is this after giving getting that rogam shot or is that without it at all if they don't receive the rogam at all then they they're at high risk for bleeding disorders in the newborn Okay, and then the one, the main one is the anemia. And that's really severe. I mean, these babies die because of erythroblastosis fatalis. And I know of one time that um, they did an intrauterine transfusion. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, your patient didn't get any prenatal care. She didn't know a blood type. She could be a homeless lady, unfortunately. She walks into, the, into your hospital and you have and you find and you do your blood work and you find out she's negative. Ay, ay, ay. So she's had no prenatal care. So you don't know what's going to happen to this baby when it's born. So you got to monitor her. And if, if the baby's um, heart rate is, is erratic, then you end up sectioning her and then she baby goes to the NICU. So you want to have you you want to have your NICU team in the OR with you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Move on I, I can tell you from experience, I'm O negative. Oh. And the reason why I was asking about whether they have it or not was because my first baby died because of the fact of not knowing that oh. I was O negative, but I went in for like my prenatal care. I like, it wasn't, you know, not doing what I needed to do. And it was a little too late to find out and we couldn't oh. save Oh. So when my other three children were born, I got the shot within 27 to 28 weeks, mm -hmm. but as soon as they came out, they immediately took them. Like I didn't get them right away and they had to do whatever they had to do to make sure that everybody was safe. Right. And they right. never waited to 72 hours for my shot. They came immediately after I pushed them out, they were rolling me over and, and jabbing me with that needle. Oh, yeah. that was Okay. Normally though, <laughs> you wait 72 hours, but with Jessica, they want to take any chance. Boom. Uh, so I had walk. wonderful, wonderful pregnancies. Everything you could get, I got. Well, I thank you for sharing because you shared about you, know, you had preeclampsia. Yeah. And, and now um, you had uh, this um, RH problem, incompatibility. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Are you done now? <laughs> um, yeah, I had yeah. cancer at 33. So oh. I had a partial oh. and I'm. Hey, I have three beautiful babies that were 
healthy and I'm still alive. So no, I can't have any more children. God bless you. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, there's yeah. always, you know, and every class I teach, there's always somebody that has got affected by it. There's always somebody, you know? Yeah. Thank you for yeah. sharing. Appreciate that. Okay, so another complication that can complicate your life would be diabetes acquired in pregnancy. It's called gestational diabetes. So what happens is that you can screen. Um, we screen about, well, it's so according to what book you read, but it could be 20, 24 weeks in there that you screen for. When the placenta is now in full force, and because remember the placenta is an endocrine, endocrine organ and can put, um, can put, put mom at more of um, uh, pre, predisposer for insulin resistance. So we screen. So as long as they they don't have any high risk, any risk factors for having you know any kind of gestational diabetes or any kind of diabetes in the past, um, she's a low risk pregnancy. We can wait. So we wait till that time and we send them for a one hour screening. Now they don't do good at the one hour screening. They're going to go for a glucose tolerance test. Yes, there's three hours. So what we're, we're looking at is to see how much glucose she's intolerant to, right? With onset during pregnancy. Because uh, we, we can control gestational diabetes. Normally we can control that with what? A diet. 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 Yeah. And what else can she do? She can walk a little bit, right? After, after eating, go out and walk a little bit. That helps what? break up all that glucose. Okay, so here's your effect of pregnancy on glucose metabolism. Remember your hormones, estrogen and progesterone? Yeah, then you have another hormone, which is an enzyme, um, ins insulinase and increased prolactin. Now that's another hormone that you need for what? Lactation. So all these beautiful hormones can do havoc on a woman's glucose. So that's why, because you have an increased, remember I said resistance of cells to insulin and increased speed of the breakdown of insulin. So you have to be very careful. So let's see your brain teaser. What would normally happen to a woman's blood glucose level during pregnancy? It elevates. It, it would elevate, right? Because of all the extra she's got going in there, what the placenta, and remember we just said all the organs get affected, and the metabolism of um, the breakdown of sugar is all there. Okay, so it does increase. So if you had diabetes as a type one, the major problem you have with a type one diabetic is there at more risk for a congenital anomaly, okay? Because what happens is that they have too much sugar that's circulating during the, when the fetus is growing, the embryonic time, too much sugar. And that causes the abnormality to happen. So our type ones, we, if they're, when they, they decide they're going to have a baby. We have to watch them very closely because they're also prone for kidney failure. Okay, so this is a, a kind of a busy looking slide, but I'll let you read it at your um, when you had nothing to do. Okay, but just know that we always have to be careful with insulin production because you can have periods of what we'll call hyperglycemia, and. Um, and we do put them on insulin if we need to, because insulin is a large molecule and does not cross the placenta. So these are factors that are linked to gestational diabetes. And so again, obesity, um, a large baby. These are babies that are over like nine pounds. I think my book says 8.4 pounds and higher is a large baby. It's like four, uh, greater than 4,000 grams. And the end, um, it usually happens, can happen to women, AMA, advanced maternal age. Yeah. You know, it's a trade-off. Remember we talked about that, you know, waiting too long and, and to have babies. And then if they have a whole bunch of unexplained um, stillbirths, we have to, uh, because of congenital anomalies, because related to type one. It can happen. 
a lot of times if they're real brittle, it means they're not controlled at all. And um, before they get pregnant, we, they're not advised to get pregnant. Um, and then we have, you know, remember your family history. Okay. We want to make sure her history, make sure that she have it. Did you have gestational diabetes with um, your first pregnancy? Because the tendency to repeat it is hot. So we would do, you know, that screening test I told you about, we probably do it a little sooner on those kind of patients because I want to pick it up sooner. Um, and then and remember fasting um, glucose over 126 milligrams per deciliter or post-meal glucose over 200 milligrams per deciliter. You got, you got trouble, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's show, let's um, look at this cute little picture. This is called a macrosomic infant. It's a big baby. And it comes, this picture comes right out of your book. And it's got huge shoulders. You see the little guy? He's got no neck. He's full of a lot of fluid. And he, he's a big baby. Now, you wouldn't want to deliver that baby vaginally because she could have shoulder dystocia and where the head would come, come, kind of pop out, would pop out, and then the shoulders would have a hard time coming through. Those babies end up with a broken clavicle. So when you have a macrosomic baby on ultrasound, you try to advise the woman to go for a C-section. A lot of ladies say no too. So anyway, you try your best. Treatment, um, again, remember I told you diet? I put in red for you, monitoring glucose levels. You might see this kind of question again, ketone monitoring. Remember I said exercise, walking. And then um, we always will watch the babies. We'll do non-stress tests, fetal well-being. Okay, so care during labor. Um, we have to give her regular insulin during labor. Because don't forget, um, we're probably not going to give feeder. So we'll have the insulin and then you assess glucose level. We do it hourly and we have to adjust the insulin accordingly. Uh, they, do, they do okay in labor. As long as we don't have a macrosomic baby, we're okay, okay? They can have oh, such dysocia. Okay, now care of the, the neonate whose mommy is gestational diabetic. So the main thing is hypoglycemia. So some books say 40 milligrams per deciliter. So um, I want you, I'm going to challenge you to see what your book um, says, but not now. Some books say 45, some say 40. Um, I learned 40, so that's why I'm questioning that. And then injury related to a macrosomic, I told you, you can have an injury, broken clavicle, you get a baby stuck. Um, a lot of times these big old babies, they can't fit through the pelvis. So they end up, um, you know, they may have some um, caposuchidemia where the, the caput part of the head tries to come through, but the pelvis is not wide enough. And then you always monitor the mom um, for the first 24 hours after birth. And breastfeeding. Yeah, you can breastfeed. Okay, so we're gonna go through this real quick about heart disease. Um, Remember, clotting factors are increased. So you have what? Increase of thrombus. Thrombus. She can throw a clot. And she can throw a clot after delivery. And um, that could be like a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. And she has any problems like congestive heart failure, which she can, because remember, she has an increase in what? Um, cardiac output, 45%. So she has this increase. Um, she's at prone for congestive heart failure. If she's got any kind of heart disease. And I tell you, these women that we saved, I know because I've been in the field so long, these women I saved um, as a preemie at 26 weeks, they're coming back having these babies and they have heart problems. And so the fetus also takes a hit when mommy has a heart problem because it decreases what? The blood flow to the fetus. Makes sense. So these are signs of congestive heart failure during pregnancy. Now, just like in med surge, they have this persistent cough. 
kind of annoying cough. You ever heard of a patient congestive heart failure? Then when you do your lung sounds, you can, they're moist. And then, of course, they're going to be tired. Anytime they get up and move around, like having any kind of exertion, they're going to be very, very weak. Okay. And then you got some pitting edema in where? In the lower extremities. And then you got palpitations, you know, the heart, right? And then because of all that, you can have changes in the fetal heart rate. So we are watching the fetal heart rate very closely. So she's on continuous monitoring because we want to make sure because at any time this baby can get what? Hypoxia. So um, treatment. Well, she's going to be under the care of an obstetrician and a cardiologist. We work hand in hand with them. And priority care. She's a, she is a high risk patient, by the way. She's really high risk. And um, we're going to limit it any kind of uh, physical activity. She may be on some beta blockers, uh, maybe beta energetic blockers, anticoagulants. So it's their high risk. Okay. And you, and you think, oh, we're going to have a C-section. No, 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 no. Vaginal birth is preferred. Why? If she's already having issues and she's bleeding, right? She, yeah, she could be at high risk. For um, respiratory complication and infection. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. We don't want to, these kind of patients, um, we rather, vaginal actually is better than a C-section. C-sections um, uh, carry a lot of complications, a lot. All right, and then you may have a patient that may be anemic. She don't take her iron. And we have two types of uh, anemia. You have one that's nutrition, which is what? Low iron deficiency. And then you may have a folic acid deficiency. Now, if they have genetic background disorders, you got a couple genetic disorders. You got sickle cell anemia, and those patients get pregnant. And um, you have to be very careful with your management. And then you have thalassemia. And thalassemia, again, this is a blood disorder that involves less than normal amount of oxygen carrying protein. All right. So what happens when you have a nutritional anemia? Well, again, you're tired. Your mucous membranes are pale. Now you can always look at somebody and you can tell if they're anemic or not by just looking inside their mouth. And then you have shortness of breath and their heartbeat will pounding. Now with really bad anemia, severe, they have a pul rapid pulse. You don't wanna get that low. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give her vitamins, right? Iron supplements, all right? Now, vitamin, iron cannot, you don't take iron with milk or antacids, heads up. Remember that, okay? You don't give it with tea either, heads up, okay? Um, vitamin C is okay, like orange juice with iron, because why? It enhances the absorption of the iron. Now, that's a test question. Okay. Now, treatment, I told you, you give an iron supplement. And you and after they deliver, you continue that to about three months um, until everything gets what, corrected. And that's where a lot of times women don't want to, they don't want to be bothered with iron because it makes them what, constipated. Okay. And then with sickle cell, you know what sickle cell is? Um, it's a genetic disorder. And um, what happens the, is an abnormal hemoglobin. Instead of having a nice round concave hemoglobin RBC, you have like a sickle. And they have a lot of pain, especially when um, they go into what? Um, crisis. And if you have somebody who's in labor and she goes and she's having all this pain, you want to really control her pain because pregnancy can cause um, a crisis. So you wanna decrease the amount of pain during the labor. Thalassemia is another um, disorder too, genetic disorder. And this involves the two change of hemoglobin. You have the um, alpha and you have the beta. And what happens is that you have, um, this is inherited. 
Okay. And you have, you know, the gene from each parent. If you have from each parent, they have the beta, which is the major. And then if you have an abnormal gene, um, you know, from, the, from, from either one of the parents, then the, they will have a minor. So I just want you to just kind of um, give a little, you know, little tidbit about thalassemia. All right. Yeah, you know, they do pretty good. I had a patient that had thalassemia and she did really well during her pregnancy and didn't have any problems. And then we had the baby tested. Okay, nursing care for anemias. Okay, so what are you as a nurse going to do? Well, going to teach her. Remember, we went over. Remember that question I gave you, iron deficiency anemia? Okay, know what foods to give her, okay? Remember we talked about green leafy vegetables? All right. Um teach them how to take supplements. You know, I had a patient that over overdosed on uh, iron. She was okay. The baby was okay, but you can't overdose on iron. You do not take it with milk. So remember that. Um, and don't take um, antacids with iron. No Tums. You know, a lot of women, see, you think, oh, that's, but a lot of women take Tums during pregnancy. All right. But you can't take it if you're taking iron. All right. And tea, you don't give um, tea to someone who's on iron either. Remember what the stools are going to look like, right? Dark green to black. Okay. And, and sometimes they'll have a question like on a test that your patient is on iron supplement and she's asking you, why is her stools? I mean, is that normal if her stools are so dark? You know, and, and you, would know, you would know how to answer that. Okay. All right, infections. I want to go over infections real fast with you. It's called TORCH. It's an acronym that basically stands for like tonsils plasmosis, which is the T, which if you're eating raw meat or you're handling cat litter, you're, you're prone to this parasite called toxoplasmosis. It's not good for the baby. Um, o, it just stands for other. And then R is your rubella. Remember, we don't give rubella injection during pregnancy. Never, never give it during pregnancy. She either gets it before pregnancy and she has to wait one month or she gets it at delivery after she delivers. Okay. And then you have um, cytomegalia virus and then you have your herpes. Okay. So that's called torch. Okay, let's see here. Remember viral infections, remember it's a virus, there's no effective therapy for it. So it may have some vaccines and immunizations, but remember rubella never given during pregnancy, live viruses, injections, never during pregnancy. And each these slides, what I did for you was give you each um, infection, and go over the infections um, there, um, the psychomegalia virus. And they have a lot of congenital infections in the newborn. They're the cause of it. Um, again, no effective treatment is known. And so sometimes when somebody actually uh, is, is positive for a CMV, what they do is they actually have a, a therapeutic abortion because um, if, if it's early in pregnancy. Not, it's not, not, these things are nasty infections. And rubella, so here's your rubella. And if, and the effects of the uh, um, rubella on the embryo is significant. This is why we don't give the immunization during pregnancy because it can cause the baby to have what we call uh, micro um, cephaly, which um, is a small head, okay? M-I-C-R-O, cephaly, small head. Um, they may have some disability in, in intellectual. Um, they can have cataracts as, a, as an infant, baby. Um, they can have ear, ear hearing. It, it affects the ears so they could get be deaf. So again, it could affect their um, growth in utero. So you've got an IUGR baby, which is an intrauterine growth restricted baby. Not good. So that's why rubella, we want to do the titer on it on her in the beginning if she doesn't know. If she's not immune, we wait till the pregnancy goes through. At the end of the pregnancy, you can give it the rubella 
and you make sure you give it so she so she's covered for the what the next pregnancy because you know lord and behold they go home and, and they're back already okay, okay so what happens if the titer comes back that the mother hasn't gotten um vaccinated for rubella does the pregnancy continue with the titer being like that oh yeah you, you know you have to be very careful but you tell her you know you, uh, you you're not immune so you keep away well, you be careful when you get around other people and children because um if they have any kind of Ill illness um then it you can you know get affected um then you got a problem so you tell her you're not immune so you have to be very careful during the pregnancy because these things what they can happen what if you do acquire it what can happen to the fetus not a good thing okay then herpes um real quick about herpes if you have an active lesion, you're not going to deliver vaginally because you don't want that baby coming through because herpes is a virus and you have two types. You have the type one, which is your little fever blisters. And then you have your other ones that type two, which is your genital herpes. Now, herpes, you can get infected and you don't even know it until when? Until you have an outbreak. Um, it lays really lays dormant in the spinal column of the of the dorsal area of your spinal uh, column. So it just lays there and it can be, it could activate itself. Sometimes I know women getting married, sometimes if they have that infection, um, they, they're under stress, it can activate the herpes to come out. The main thing about what you have to worry about pregnancy is that you don't want them to come, you don't want this baby to come through the vagina. Okay. They have to have a C-section. There's no doubt about it. All right. Cause you know, we don't want babies to breathe that in. Okay. So the treatment in your nursing care is of course, avoid any kind of lesions and um, you want to monitor mom and baby and Breastfeeding, guys, is oh, it's possible as long as there's no lesions on the breast. So you have to be very careful. So you have to, you have to look at the breast and make sure there's no lesions. All right. I'm going to scoot down here. And it's about hepatitis B. Let me just come right here. I'm just going to scoot down a little bit because we need, we're running out of time. But you have all these slides. Um, STIs, we used to call them STDs. Um, they, they're just infections that can be transmitted, okay? So you have syphilis, you have the gonorrhea, you have chlamydia, you have trichomonas, and you have these condylomas accumulative, which is what we call condylomas. They're like genital warts. Have you ever seen them? Never forget them. And um, you have to, these, again, it's another type of infection. And you have to be very, very careful during pregnancy because uh, you have the risk of direct transmission. And, and that's why we do the VDRL and the RPR to make sure that she doesn't have it. That's why we do a culture on chlamydia and, uh, and trick. because And then you can, you can see the genital wards. If somebody comes in to your clinic, they're very prominent there. HIV. Uh, your HIV, you, all, you know about HIV. So what I'm going to go over basically is you know how you can acquire it through sex, through um, needles, right? And um, so women can get, you know, HIV um, and babies can get HIV, okay, from mom. So um, babies get infected by trans placenta. Unfortunately, it does cross the placenta. And then you also can get infected with maternal secretions at birth and Guys, this this baby does not get breastfed. Write that down. No breastfeeding with an HIV mom because it, it goes right through, goes right through. And here on this slide, I highlighted it for you because I wanted you to remember that is that breastfeeding is absolutely contraindicated for that. Okay, let's see here. Um, I talked about toxic plasmosis already, about cat feces. So here's a little bit more about it. Um, but you know about it. All right. The, the thing thing here, if any, if any of your patients like to eat raw meat, you, you got to tell them no, not during pregnancy. If they have a cat, no, not during pregnancy. Have somebody else do that for you. All right. Let me see if I have any more brain teasers here. Uh, 
UTIs are never good. You don't want your patient to get cystitis or polynephritis, right? We talked about that because that leads into um, preterm labor. All right. Let's see if I have any more brain teasers. This is good stuff about environmental hazards during pregnancy. Kind of gives you an idea. Substance abuse, right? Cocaine, all that kind of stuff. Heroin, not good. You know, it all goes to baby and alcohol. Alcohol goes straight to baby. And the baby has what we call alcohol syndrome. And those little babies have little heads. And they have like this, they have a very, very, very skinny upper lip very, very skinny, and they have intellectual problems. We talked about trauma and suicide, homicide, um, automobile accidents, all those are trauma, and what they do, they can lead to an abruptio placenta. So you have to be careful because women do come in with all kinds of bruises, and women say, oh no, I'm okay, but you have to really dig deep and get in there. Okay, so um, let's see. And it, these are pretty good. There's little safety alerts and grieving. Let me go over this with you real quick. If you got a grieving couple, they lost their baby, they had stillbirth, they had a miscarriage. Um, that's a that was a preg that's a pregnancy, that's a baby. And so you have to have let them have time to remain together in privacy. And you set behaviors related, related to grieving. Let them grieve. Make what I want to get out of this slide is give them a little memento box. Okay. At Florida Hospital, we had um, the little white rose on the box. And uh, we put the footprints in there, a little lock of hair, baby bracelet, and, and take a picture. Um, and there's some really, really, really good photography now with pictures and how they, they put the pictures up. Um, footprints, we do footprints and handprints. Um, and then let them hold the baby. That's on an exam. Uh, let them hold the baby. Very important. They need to hold the baby. Now, say they don't want to hold the baby right away. That's okay. You can, baby goes to the morgue. And you can get the baby out. But don't give the mom a cold baby. If, you, if she says she didn't want to see it in the beginning. And then maybe about four hours later, she says, I'd like to see my baby. You go down with security and go get the baby, but put the baby on the warmer first and then let her hold it. Okay. And all you always discuss, you know, with the parents. And I think you have a sim on a fetal demise, if I think from right, but you might, you might. Okay. So that's the end, guys, to this lecture. Um, so take uh, five minutes, uh, five minutes. And um, get your thinking caps on. And um, and then we'll make sure. Now, don't forget about supine. Let me give you some tidbits. Supine hypotension. I think I had that on my study guide. What, what, what you know, this time they're going to ask you how um, we know how to avoid it. Put her on her left side. Mm -hmm. But... What does actually supine hypertension syndrome actually reduce? Blood uh, return to the heart. Circulation from the aorta. Yeah. So yeah. So by so when you put it on the side, you want to you want to make sure that what the baby gets more blood, right? Okay. I have a quick question. Uh huh. Um, what was the? Because I was trying to find it. Um, yeah. When does the woman expect to feel the baby? When was it? Sixteen to twenty-four weeks. As um, no, she usually feels it. Who, who, who knows that answer? 18 to 20? 18 to 20. Yes, 18 to 20 weeks. Give that lady a hand. Yes. What Thank guide you. did you put out? Because I got the worksheet. Week three study guide. I put that out. It's out there. Yeah. I got chapter five. Um, it's in your, it should be in your inbox. Yeah, on the, the on the, um, hold up because on the PowerPoint it had sixteen to twenty weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but let me let me refresh. Eighteen to twenty. Eighteen to twenty. Okay. Eighteen to twenty. Eighteen to twenty. Eighteen to twenty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
How about um, about iron deficiency? What um, you're doing a teaching plan? Who has for somebody who has iron deficiency anemia and they're placed on iron supplements? So what are you gonna what are you gonna give them? Well, how, first of all, what about citrus fruits? Is that good? Yes, yes you yes. can take it with vitamin C because yes. it increases well, the absorption. You got it. You got it. Get that girl a hand. Um. Do you give milk? No, 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 no coffee, tea, or can milk. You, can you take your iron supplements with tomato juice? No, I, I would be too afraid of the acid. Okay, uh, I was how asking. About brand, how about brand products? Um, yeah, some of them are calcium fortified. So you, you don't want to take, listen up, everybody, brand products reduce the iron iron deficiency so you don't want to do that all right so you're not going to do that so you're so going to take you one hour okay. before you eat your meal for best absorption you could mm -hmm. okay what about tea no no, no tea good okay and i just got done saying this when she gets done how long should she continue with her iron after she has the baby she still keeps going right how many months? Three. Three months. Three months. I just went over that, right? Three months. Okay, got it? You got it? All right. Placenta previa, right? What kind of pain? Painful. Painless. No, not painless. 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 Said, whoever said painful, cross that out. Is placenta previa is what? Bright painless. red bleeding that's right, painless. Right. Painless bleeding. Right. You want to keep your fingers out of her vagina, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so she would not, we would not do a, a contraction stress test on this patient, correct? That was in your lecture. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So I I'm a I'm a patient and I got some nausea vomiting during pregnancy. What are you gonna tell me to do? Crackers, a meal. Wake eat, crackers. eat crackers, eat crackers, eat Good. crackers. Yeah, eat those crackers, plain old crackers. Okay. Eat crackers on the bed. Yeah, well, <laughs> make it back in your bed. <laughs> get, the, get the vacuum out. It's better than start throwing all over your bed. <laughs> A woman, uh, um, okay, so uh, if I got, if I'm eight weeks pregnant, and I come in, I tell you, I got some cramping and a small amount of vaginal bleeding. What do I got? Threatened. Threatened. Yeah. yeah. What kind right. of abortion? Threatened. 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 Right, right. So I'm gonna put it in bed with this. Good, 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 good. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of fun, right? Is, it? Um, hey, is Nicholas what? the only guy in our class right now? Yeah, he is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 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 He's doing very well. Um, what kind of weight gain should a normal woman with a normal height, how many pounds should she gain during her pregnancy? 20, 25, 25 to 35. 35. Yeah. Okay. okay. And last week, last week, we talked about airplane traveling, did we not? Yes. I think yes. I think Nicky still missed the last question. He said how many? Nicholas is 25 to 35 pounds. That's okay. right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about air traveling, right? Yeah. What what's a, what what are we concerned about? Clots. For long time. Yeah. The, um, the thromboembolism. All right, mm -hmm. you got it. Deep vein thrombos. Good, 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 good. Okay. And you all uh, if you have to do an intake, you know how to calculate the intake because what? You had on, <laughs> on your you had on your Joseph's calculation exam. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody. Everybody ready to take their quiz? Yeah. Ms. Dunham, I got a question. Sure. Are your A's just coming through email? Because those links I did not, like the links on yours, because you said to put an A in there. I didn't get links. Only thing I saw was these worksheets that you posted that said, be mindful of these in the notebook. That's what I got. So you are they always email? coming through? Huh? I you check you your Canvas email. Yes, you're doing it straight. I just want to know from now because everything you talked about I already know because I read it. But just for purposes of getting that aid, 
I want to know where I'm looking at. Is it strictly okay. email? Yeah. She went, no, this, it let should me be tell in your you. announcements. Let me tell you. I, that's not in the announcement, babe. Two oh, wow. ways I communicate. Yes. Two ways. In Canvas, either in your inbox, I'll send you. And look, go all the way down because the attachment is lower. Okay? All right. And I always put a little um, sentence. I have attached blank. If I go all the way down and you'll see the attachment. Now, okay. there's another way I do it is on the announcements. And I usually put them yeah, in there. I put a good label on all my announcements. Yeah. But be careful when you go into the announcement, you have to go all the way down to to see if there's an attachment. Okay. And that attachment will be like skinny. You know, it's a it's a one-line sentence. But it's there. Yeah, that's, I don't like I, sh I can't even send you a screenshot of this. But the last okay. ones for this week is like chapter five PowerPoints, questions regarding chapter five nursing care, chapter two, or week two, chapter four, exam one prep study, week three. I didn't get anything about the aid and the announcement. And I got like a ring of yeah. announcements. I don't know if it's mixed from you and other people. I but try I to check it. I, I just okay. make sure I check my email. Always. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of teacher that I, I, Think of things that can help you. Yeah. And that's what I do. Okay, everybody. If you need me extra, we can um, have a private Zoom or we can do another, you know, whatever. Okay. I'm always here to help you. Okay. Are we ready to take the quiz? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good luck, everybody. Read those questions. What about the, we talk about airplane while being pregnant. This question, no, we don't discuss. Yeah, last week lecture when we discussed traveling, especially by airplane. Are we starting while airplane? Being pregnant. Mm -hmm. What is the primary primary risk? Blood you, mm -hmm. Number nine. Is the the deep vein thrombosis or the clotting factor? That's right. Okay, you got it. Okay, everybody. Good say, luck. Again, say again. I don't. Blood clots, Nick. Blood clots. Blood okay. clots. Blood. Yes. Okay. okay. All right, everybody. Oh, I remember. Okay. Thank All right. you. That's it. Thank you. You only got 15 minutes. Go for it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Everybody mute themselves, please. Yeah. Okay. okay.
<clears throat> Make sure you stay on till 5.30. At 5.30, you will put your name in the chat.
we're almost finished. We have two more people still working on the quiz. Go ahead and finish up. And at 530, if you want to leave, everybody, you can. I will stay on to go over the quiz if you like. Are you talking to us? Yes. You're muted. No, no, I don't think so. Unless you muted me. <laughs> I, I hear you. you. I can hear you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, no partial clip. Yeah, if you got partial credit on this, I have to go back in and take it out. So there's no partial credit. It didn't say select all that apply. So yeah, how does that work? If you don't get all of it, then you get you know. But get it, it didn't it didn't say select all that apply though. So we get oh, it I don't know no, which it one. Is it which, which one. one? Yeah, I don't know which one yet. I have to look at them. Okay, but if it didn't say select all that apply, we don't do we get our points back because it didn't say it? Yeah, I'll check it. If you if you if it didn't say all that apply, sure. So I think it, I know which one it was that didn't say. Okay, it, but, but I know we people still got still two testing. people taking a test. Yeah. So. Okay, everybody finished? Yes, put a thumbs up. It's called communication. Okay. All right. So let's go over. I am unmuted. Um, so let's go over number one. So a nursing student asked the nurse to explain why pregnant women are advised to avoid the supine position while sleeping. The nurse answers which with which correct statement. I'm going to stop the recording at this point now, everybody. Uh-oh. Yes, I do.